Hi everyone, it's Mark Hayward from the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast. I'm here uh, for an interview with John Burra, who is a CEO and lead developer at Mammoth Interactive. On this interview, we're going to talk about coding, we're going to talk about online courses, and we're going to talk about his early guitar teaching career. He has lots of businesses and side hustles, so it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Hopefully you enjoy it. Hi, John. Nice to see you. Nice to speak to you again. Um, I just wanted to uh, touch base. So we're going to talk about your career and uh, your trajectory to CEO. Um, and it all started in coding in 1997 at a local university. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so, so, so I started how my... How did you start up doing your coding in 1997? So um, I was really into computers, uh, you know, um, back then in the 90s, not everyone had a computer, if you can believe yeah. that. And I begged my dad to get a computer. And once, once I did, I was, I was fiddling around with the coding. And, you know, one summer there was, you know, kids are out for summer, so they need to do something. Yeah. And they said, well, make your own, um, make your own game in, in coding. And I'm like, well, that sounds like me. So I went and I loved it. And it was, a, it was a really, really good course. Yeah. And, you know, back then things were not like they are today. Like today making a game is really easy, but making a game in, uh, in 1997 was really hard. And like, I, it didn't come out with anything that looked good or anything. Cause it was, it was just so difficult. Like even 10 years ago, it was pretty hard to make a game, yeah. but um, so I started that and then I started coding ever since. And, um, you know, that one thing led to another. Awesome. And so, so, so just to get a bit of an insight into, um, coding in 1997 before we, we had iPhones before, what, what, what was, so you said it was difficult to, to, to build games. It was difficult to do most things on computers at that stage with a slow speed and slow capacity. So how, how was it that you actually sort of built your game? up in, 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 in the nineties. Like it was a very simple, uh, text, text based game wow. because that's basically what you could do. Um, you know, there, it wasn't even until the two thousands where you actually had like a, a good, you know, editor that anyone could use and yeah. make a game. So like you basically learn the programming concepts, um, you know, through that. And, you know, we, we did make a game, but, uh, we also learned a bunch of uh, computing concepts. And it was, some of the things were, were so difficult that, you know, if you pointed to something, because it was C++, right? If you pointed to something, that thing wasn't there, it would crash. Nowadays, it's kind of laughable to have that happen in, in any of your game engines. But back then, if you made like the, the smallest bit of mistake, yeah. then it would completely just break your game. Oh. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit further about your gaming at a later stage in, in this uh, interview. So, so you, from, from coding, you then started to teach guitar. Um, so what sort of skills did you develop um, at an early age with, with actually teaching guitar? So I was really into a lot of things as a kid. I was a, a full, I was a nerd because, again, I spent my summer coding, which in the 90s wasn't... Uh, <laughs> wasn't really cool to do as it is now uh but um but you know i was playing music for a long time and i practiced my guitar like for several hours a day in in uh, junior high and high school and you know what i found out what guitar teachers made and it was well above minimum wage <laughs> and so i'm <laughs> said you know what i think i think i can do that too yeah. and you know i actually had like a, a beard in high school so i looked like i was 24 so that also helped me but i i went to a, like a local guitar store yeah. and i i applied to the job and i passed the interview and they didn't know i was 18 <laughs> at the time right they didn't know that but um so i i got the job and they basically put 53 students a week to me and i learned so much uh with that job you know just kind of like you know how do you get someone that knows nothing about anything to being good. And music is, is something that a lot of people want their kids to learn, uh, you know, because it's both creative and technical. And there's a ton of research out there that says, if you get your kid to learn music, they'll become smarter. And that's, a, there's a lot of science behind that too. Yeah. You know, years and years, like basically every two years is an article or a, a, a paper that comes out that says, Hey, if you're in music, then your kids are probably going to, you're probably going to do better on, on test scores and just in life in general. So, 
you know, that was really my first foray into education. And, you know, a couple years later, I got a job at a different studio when I was making five times minimum wage, right? Wow. And I had my own, uh, my own studio at my own house. So I learned, you know, like simple things when you're an entrepreneur. It's like, you know, booking clients, keeping clients, you know, delivering a good product. All of this stuff taught me like everything I needed to know about entrepreneurship. And um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it, it was staggering that I saw that you, you had 53 students a week, which is, is, is a phenomenal uh, dedication to, to, to the teaching. Yeah, um, it, it's funny because I wanted to work a few days and they filled up my whole schedule. And it was, it was actually really difficult at first because, you know, with I did teach like a couple friends guitar earlier on, but... Um, what happened was is that like I was it was I was just basically thrown off the deep end and yeah. I kind of made it all work. But yeah, it's you know, I, I learned a lot in that first job. And 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 I suppose it's um it's one of those situations it's sink or swim, isn't it? If you if you're you're then exposed to this the situation where you've got fifty three students, you have to, as you say, keep your clients, keep keep your keep the momentum of each of those 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 kids that are learning, I suppose it could be adults as well, that are learning how to do something. And I what I like is the fact that you said it's creative and technical. I think that's really important about learning a, a, an instrument because it's one of those situations that it is a very it's usually in both parts of your brain isn't it to be being creative and technical um did that develop your um do you think that's helped you going forward in your your career being able to bo be both technical and creative at the same time absolutely so there's there's a few disciplines and music is definitely one of them where it's both technical and creative like you can make like you can write a song and it technically works, but it sounds terrible, right? <laughs> right? So, you know, coding is also creative and technical at the same sides. And like, depending on what kind of coding that you're doing, um, you know, it could be some, some's a little more technical and some's a little bit more creative. Like front end development is very creative. Like if you're a front end developer and your websites don't look good, yeah, then that's a huge problem, right? Yeah. So if you're an app developer or, or game development in spe it specifically is very technical and creative at the same time. Um, so it has helped me a lot. And if we fast forward later on in my career, I always make sure that when you, when you build something, it has to look good. It has to feel good because that's a whole part of the software development experience now. Yeah. You know, we were talking earlier, like in the 90s, like things just had to work, right? And then even in the early 2000s, like if you look at a website from like 2002, like it's it's hilarious of what, what people actually passed away as websites yeah, yeah. now. But today, you know, everything is very well designed and we can attribute Apple to a lot of that. Like as soon as yeah. the iPhone came out, they really, like they put all of their creative and user experience um, uh, kind of motifs yeah. into the code, like into the code level. And over the years, I've shown people how to access both the creative side and the technical side through coding. And that's given me a huge edge because in most computer science and computer engineering degrees, they only teach the technical side. Yeah. Like there's no design 101 in a uh, uh, CS uh, degree. That's awesome. Um, and, and so you then went into gaming. So just tell me a little bit about how you started developing uh, and coding for games. So one of the things I wanted to do in 2008 was, um, is I had this algorithm that would compose um, audio on the spot. Right. And I pitched it to many game, uh, game uh, developers, but this was 2008 and 2009. Okay. And no one was hiring at that time. So I'm like, okay, why don't I just make a complete game from scratch? Now I did it back like in, you know, 1997 in the early 2000s, but you know, that's a, that was a long time ago at this point in time. So I had to find a way to make like an Xbox 360 game. And yep. there was, there was no way for me to learn how to do that, except there was this DVD set that showed me how to do that. Now there was, I basically bought the DVD set I learned how to make an Xbox 360 game. And wow. then I came out with an Xbox 360 game and I used that for my portfolio. Wow. Now this was around 2010 and having a game for your portfolio like this wasn't as common as it is today. Like nowadays, 
if you want to get hired as an app developer or web developer or game developer, you have to have a really good portfolio. But yeah. back then, you know, it was, you know, I basically got a bunch of freelancing gigs, but you know, it was still pretty difficult to get a job, even though I, I built a complete game from scratch. And, and so tell me about the game that you, that, that you built in 2008, nine. Yeah. So it was, um, it was a rhythmic shooter. So um, what it was is it was a, uh, it was kind of a game where, um, you, it was a basic shooter, uh, like okay. a, like a 360 shooter, kind of like okay. Geometry Wars. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, would, it had this rhythm to it and it would kind of create music on the spot. Um, so again, just kind of using all, everything I've learned to make something uh, into, um, into a career. And that's actually a good tip for your listeners is that, you know, even if you, um, if, if something you do doesn't work out, you can always use that in the next iteration because yes. life moves so quickly yeah. that, you know, you can say, okay, well that didn't work or maybe the timing isn't right. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, if you got a, you know, if you graduated in 2006 or 2008 from university, uh, like there's a whole different options for, uh, for you. So like sometimes the timing isn't right for your idea or, or your career, et cetera, but you can always use that in the next iteration and, and, and it sounds a bit cliched now with with lots of people talking about this about failing fast but equally your failures are really important because they as you say they might not be because the idea is not very good it could just be a a, a, a time a time problem what, what would you say one of your failures that you've done anywhere in your career that has really helped you look 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 and go forward from um well one of the things that again uh, believe it or not, that uh, by focusing too much on the audio spectrum and not the programming spectrum, um, because at the time, you know, when you make a game or an app, there's only so much resources that a computer could have. Yeah. Like the the first Angry Birds game for mm -hmm. iPhone was um, they had to employ so many tricks just to get it to run. Right. Wow. So they had no computing power for, for music and music is, was kind of an afterthought. Mm -hmm. So I remember just waking up one day and I said, you know, if I was just like a front end developer and not even a good one, I'd be probably making more money than I am right now doing like making my own business and whatnot. Yeah. And so, and then I started to look back, right. You know, I, in the early two thousands, I was teaching guitar lessons because guitar lessons were in, like mm -hmm. I could make five times minimum wage because they were in, but, you know, five, six years later, they weren't in, right? So I, you really couldn't do the same thing I did earlier. Uh, so when I, um, so what I learned from that is that you really have to, especially in tech, look at the buzzwords, right? Okay. Once you look at the buzzwords and you look at what people are hiring for, you want to be able to learn that as quickly as possible so you can get hired or make a product. Yeah. And so that, that adaptability in your, your early part of your career, you say you, that was one of your strengths. Cause as you say, it's, it's not, so, so, so linking back to sort of the stuff that I talk about with business and stuff, it sometimes it's a buzzword. Sometimes it's a, it's a process. It's a understanding um, a, a concept, which is important to, to adapt and, and to win. Would you say um, adaptability is one of, one of the best skills, one of the most useful skills for an entrepreneur? Absolutely. Uh, you have to be able to read the marketplace and see what, what is, um, is, is going, what, well, what's happening essentially. And, and how would you, how would you read the market? So I, I recently, um, or well, about six months ago, I did a course on user research and that was very much being able to, 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 to get qualitative results and be able to, um, inform the business on how the market is, is sensing. How, what sort of skills, what sort of ways did you, um, were you able to read the market? So one of the things that I, I learned over the years is that technology moves, um, technology moves pretty quickly, right? And so like two years from now, there could be some new buzzword that nobody knows how to do today. And if you know how to do that, then you can go to a VC and get funding. You, yeah. If you're a programmer, you can get a job and you can demand yeah. more money. It's just simple supply and demand. So a good example of this is that to make an iPhone game like, um, in around 2010, it was really, really difficult because they had this um, programming language called Objective-C. And it was 
really hard to use, like really, really hard to use. Okay. So they came up with, um, Apple came up with a new language called Swift and Swift was amazing. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite coding languages today. Okay. And what I did is I spent two weeks, I learned everything there is to know about Swift. And then I put out um, an 80 hour course all by myself. I'm not even joking. Wow. An 80 hour course all by myself. And, um, and what I did is I also put in, um, I also did a bunch of master classes and instantly I was one of the top course providers on Swift at right. the time. So, and because of that, I made quite a bit of money teaching it. And I made quite a bit of money doing the, the webinars and all, and all those master classes, et cetera. But it's because I was able to learn Swift so quickly, yeah. or I, I guess you could say I learned Swift swiftly, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, but I learned, I learned it so quickly that I was able to capitalize on that. Now, if, you know, there's a lot of, Swift is kind of old news. There's something new coming out, right? Like the new yeah. thing is Flutter, and we have a course on that as well. And and so just interestingly, just touching base on the sort of coding side. So so I'm not a coder, but I work with my my job is to work with coders from a, a tech side. So I look at I'm in the business side of a technology business. Would you say um, this is sort of a left field question, but it's just see how it how it sort of lands. Are you any good at languages, uh, spoken languages, as you have a deep knowledge of coding languages? You know, it's funny you ask that because whenever someone asks me on a forum, do you speak any other languages? Mm -hmm. I always put C++ <laughs> as a joke, right? Yes, yes, uh, yes. But the act actually is at no. So I was in a French program in, uh, in my uh, elementary school days. And I have a little bit of dyslexia. And okay. if, you, if you ever learn French, it's a think some things are swapped in English. So what? I didn't do very well in that. And I'm not very good at learning like languages, languages, Okay. but you know, coding languages is, is, it's different. Um, it's a, it's a different part of the brain. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. It was just, I was, um, one of the previous people that I, I interviewed Richard Abbott was talking about learning a, um, doing a PhD in ancient languages and, and, and he was already a coder and a developer beforehand and sort of said that he he felt it was a natural affinity now obviously we all learn things differently as different styles of learning and so um, but I just wondered if, if that was something that was um, what, what was part of your skill set as well just to flip back to the gaming side so so, so just of interest for me, this is a personal question, sophistication of gaming. Like, obviously, I, I can imagine thinking, if we go back to things like Worm and things like that on your, on your old mobile phones up to what we've got now is hugely different. But from, from the sort of 2008, 2009 side, side, where we had an iPhone, there were games that were on there, everyone was playing a PS, was it a PS3? three or whatever or and, and sort of early xboxes what what's the sort of development of gaming f from that stage from 2008 to to now the sophistication must be in the the depth of gaming it must be just increased hugely absolutely so it's it's completely different in fact gaming like any other technology continues to to just uh, completely innovate like Nowadays, there's this Google Stadia, or that's coming out soon, where you can stream a game, yes. which is incredible. Like, I, I wouldn't even imagine that two years ago, yeah. you know, but, but it's, it's going to be coming out soon, and I'm looking forward to it. But, you know, just what, what the biggest thing is that the tools to make the games are a lot more refined than they used to be. Okay. So, to make my Xbox 360 game, I had to go through a lot of technical work. Yeah. Just like, you know, just this thing is not working and I, and it's really technical. It doesn't improve the game or anything, but in order to get this, in order to get my game into my user's hands, I have to solve it. Right. Yeah. There's much less of that now. So people are spending more time on the design of the games, which is yeah. what I always uh, tell um, any aspiring developer to do is you always want to spend the most amount of your production production time making your product better and not dealing with technical issues, they'll come up, but you don't want to, to focus on that. Yeah. Um, and just another question from, from my interest. So what do you see of gaming with AR and VR? Do you see it as the future for gaming? Hmm. So 
VR is definitely, um, <laughs> I, I can definitely see it. Um, the thing, what has to happen is uh, a product has to come out that's so intuitive and so easy to use yeah. that it just, it, it makes obvious sense. And right yeah. now there isn't a product like that. Yeah. Uh, but I can see, I, the rumor is, is that Apple has these AR glasses okay. uh, that will, will completely transform the way we interact with, um, uh, with technology. And the rumor is, is that you're going to be able, you're going to be walking down the street. Like, let's say you're walking down the street in Japan yeah. and the AR glasses will translate everything for you in real time, which I think is amazing. Because wow. if you've been yes. on to a place where you don't speak the language, you know, it's like, yeah. what is this? Right. So, um, but it, it, it's definitely going to change, but I'm waiting for the product that's easy to use. And that's the obvious choice. Yeah. So, so I have a similar view about voice and a sort of Alexa and Google home and things is that I, I like the technology. I, I think it's a, it's a cool tech and, 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 but there's not been yet a killer app that's going to catapult it into every room of your, uh, of your uh, house or, or or business or whatever. So I, I, I kind of see what you mean by that. The technology is there. We just need the sort of way to make it, as you say, just that killer app, that hit spot where everyone then suddenly wants. So AR, when with the Pokemon Go um, a couple of years ago, that just exploded because um, um, it, it was using the technology and, and, and a certain proportion of the population still loved Pokemon, even from back in the, the early noughties. So um, I agree. I, I think we both VR, AR, and, and, and probably things like Alexa uh, and, and voice, um, you just need that, that thing that's the game changer, which makes it a must have where both of them are, they're, they're still wants rather than needs, aren't they? So um so so excellent so um i just wanted to now touch about um udemy so so you started becoming a udemy approved uh trainer now just for uh, for people that aren't aware of udemy can you just briefly say what udemy is and how you got the process of, of actually being approved by udemy to be on their website so I was one of the first people to be on that platform. And oh. so this was back in 2011. And, you know, at that point I had released, um, and I, I was credited on about 30, uh, 30 games at that point, you know, through freelancing and through my own, um, and through my own games, et cetera, that yeah. I've been releasing. And, you know, when I would show people, I was like, yeah, I'm an independent um, software developer. And they're like, well, how do you do that? Literally, Everybody said at the time, how do you do that? Yeah. yeah. And one of the things as business, like we were talking about, is if someone's constantly asking you the same question, then you should probably think about making a product for that, yeah. right? So, you know, in fact, there was this, I was, I, was out, um, I was out for drinks and I met some random person. He was so excited. He's like, I, I would love to learn how to make this game. I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I went home and I'm like, okay, what do I need to do next? So. I have all this teaching experience. I have all this gaming experience. I have all this coding experience. Why don't I put all of them together into this package to make like a really awesome game? And so yeah. this game, uh, so I had a course, it was about 35 hours and right. it showed people how to make uh, games from start to finish. That's the music, the art and the coding all together right. in, one, uh, in one course. And I uploaded it to Udemy and I was one of the first people to do that. And then it went um, on a site called AppSumo, which was like a deal site like Groupon. Yeah. And then I, I had made so much money from that. And then I was hooked, right? <laughs> like, let's just make as many of these courses as I can. And, yeah. uh, and it, was, it was really good because like a, a few months ago, I, my, my bank account was getting pretty low, <laughs> right? <laughs> but as soon as, as soon as it was like, it was, a, it was Boxing Day actually. So, um, or the day after Christmas, it, not everyone celebrates Boxing Day, So, right? so, so can we still find your courses on Udemy? Yep, yep. Um, even that old course, it, it's kind of obsolete though. Um, okay. you, well, you can kind of use it still, but uh, yep. Uh, if you go to Udemy or our own site, training.mammothinteractive.com awesome. or our own site, Mammoth Interactive, all our courses are there. 
Okay, brilliant. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll put in the show notes. If you provide me with the, the details of where these courses are, etc., we can all put them in the, in the show notes. So, so, so just taking a slightly different uh, take on everything we've talked about. So, so you've been a freelancer, you've been a guitar teacher, but you've also been a course designer, and now your current role as CEO and lead developers at Mammoth. So you've always been quite entrepreneurial. Yes. Why yes. do you think you were more lended towards entrepreneurial roots than, than other? Well, it's, I, I did kind of fall into it um, because like there is, um, I did, I did really want to work for a big company. Um, but, you know, graduating, you know, at a certain time, it was difficult uh, to find, to find a good, good job. Uh, but you know, it, I kind of always knew how to do it. And it's a really good skill to have. Like if, if you're looking for a side hustle, if you learn how to start your own business, even if it yeah. completely fails, right? Mm -hmm. Like we talked about failing forward, even yeah. if it completely fails, you're going to come out of that experience knowing more. Right. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've always, you know, I've always kind of wanted to do this. Um, and it, it makes the most sense because I'm a walking stereotype. Um, you know, I'm like, um, um, I'm a divergent thinker, so I, I can come up with a lot of ideas. I've got okay. a little bit of dyslexia, et okay. cetera. And, you know, walking stereotype as an entrepreneur. So it, it works out pretty well now. And um, your family entrepreneurial? Are the, uh, is, is there friends that are entrepreneurial? Or, or were you sort of at the edge doing your own thing as, as a lot of early stage entrepreneurs are? So, um, no, my family is not entrepreneurial, um, okay. <laughs> but my grandparents were because you had to be at the time. Right. Right. But, um, you know, uh, it's surprising. So when I started doing all this stuff, everyone kind of looked at me like, really you want to do this? <laughs> and I'm like, well, um, yes I do. Because, you know, I was basically faced with a choice. It's like either, you know, I mean, a lot of young people, they, they get into this kind of loop where, you don't have experience, you can't get a job. But yeah. You need a job to get experience, right? Yeah. So the way to cut through that is to intern at your own company, okay? okay? And that's exactly what I did. It's like, look, I can be spending my personal time, you know, doing whatever, but I'm going to be learning things and I'm okay. going to be producing products. And well, this is a, th sorry, go on, carry on. Yeah, and so I said to myself, okay, well, if I do that, eventually it's going to work out. And it and eventually did. And and so so some of the things I've talked about previously on my podcast is um, if you're in that sort of dilemma where you haven't got the experience to get a job and then you're in that sort of vacuum, um, interning at a company, just learning from the best, uh, the best person you can find as a gamer or an entrepreneur or businessman, or whatever it is, just sort of try and tap in into that. But you 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 didn't even you you basically started this off your own back, and if it failed, you then moved on to the next thing, and and gaming just sort of stuck. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's actually kind of funny because you know gaming you, anywhere from two thousand eight till till now, or to maybe maybe a couple of years ago, was really really hot. Uh, but then you know it's not as hot as some other things like machine learning and data science. That's the hot the hot thing now. And yeah. you know Mammoth Interactive, we produce courses on that. You know, okay. uh, we also produce a ton of game courses just because there's always that kind of um, like what, like I, if you ride the trend, you'll make more money. But at the same time, a trend might go down a bit and level off. And, yeah. you know, we find that with gaming now. So, so that's basically where it's, where it's at. And, and, and you're based in Vancouver? Yes. yes. Vancouver, you, Canada. Canada. <laughs> Have you always been in Vancouver with all your businesses? Uh, no. So um, I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, okay. yeah. moved to Toronto, and then I moved to Vancouver. So kind of the big cities of Canada. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so just to bring me on a little bit further on the business side. So, so you started Mammoth. I, I, I can't recall what year, what year did you start Mammoth? So, um, the, the current one is 2011. Okay. And, and just, um, 
how did you get investment for it? Because a lot of a lot of people who are thinking about um, starting businesses always think of it as, well, I've got to get venture capital, so I've got to get seed funding. You know, I, I need that injection of money to be able to be successful. And um, I start from a viewpoint that you don't always need to start from that point. It can be helpful if the business suits that type of, 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 of investment. But um, did you start it with investment or did you uh, start it as a, as a sort of bootstrap? So like, like I said earlier, you know, my, my money was dwindling <laughs> before I got that, that big course to, to take off. Uh, so I, I, it's basically all self-funded. And, and to this day, it's, it's all self-funded. Um, but we do run into the problem where, you know, you have to compete with these multi-million dollar companies. And what's crazy about Mammoth is that we, we have some courses that these multi-million dollar companies don't have. And we're, we're so lean. And what I would recommend that if, is you should try and at least bootstrap something before you go to an investor. Because... The last thing an investor wants to see is, hey, I built this simple app. I need $10 million. I mean, yeah, like yeah. you're probably not going to get it at that point. Yeah. You yeah. know, you're, you're going to have to have some kind of track record. Um, but it is, it's difficult. And with the, the corporate world becoming more monopolistic day by day, it becomes even harder. And how many do you employ in your company? So we have about five people. We have five people. And 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 do they are they all uh, coders developers who sort of traverse into other areas or do you how how's the sort of makeup of the business? So I have I have a couple coder, coders. Um, I have a graphic designer and an assistant and a video editor. Um, awesome. Yeah, and and the thing about um, my business is that it's it's extremely lean, right? Like um, like a lot of startups are lean, uh, but you know the people that I've employed, and, and this is a big big tip, is you always want to hire the right people. Yes. Okay, and if the person's not the right person, you got to get rid of them right away. Yeah. Um. So um. So, for example, one of the first coders I hired, I fired the next day because he was just not right for the job, right? Uh, and it was just, you know, he just wasn't right for the job. Um, good coder. But, um, you know, the people that I have working for me are extremely good and they, they know what, what, what's going on. And I suppose there's a, there's a compatibility in, in, in any business. So I, 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 I work for a corporate, um, but I... Oh, oh, Within a, any corporation, there it's always a subset of a subset of a subset, and you're part of one team, and then you're part of another team, part of another team, and the sort of the technology area of um, of my business, I, I think uh, um, a lot of it personalities. Now, it's not necessarily as easy to fire someone because they don't fit a, 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 a sort of um, uh, a sort of compatibility, perhaps in 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 the business, but. Um, I think it's incredibly important to make up soft teams and there should be so so there should be that should complement each other so if, if you're a creative ideas man you need a, a someone who's going to know the detail and be able to work with the detail so um, I, I always talk I've talked a couple of times on my podcast about makeup of teams are incredibly important and have diversity within your group you, you don't want the same like you don't want five or six of you in your team because you 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 do everything from the creative side to the technical side you need people to deliver what your vision is as well um you, so, so has it taken a while to get the right people are, are you are, are you sort of comfortable with your your makeup of your team i'm, I'm not saying like are you gonna fire anyone tomorrow or anything like that i'm not <laughs> suggesting that but you know what i mean just more like is, 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 has it been a constant thing of finding the right people or did you find the right mix and you've now got that and you're, you're stuck, you're, you're settled and happy with that? Yeah, it, it did. Yeah, I mean, it did take a little while. Now, the way that I do things, like, so when you work for Mammoth, you want to, the whole point is that you want to do something and produce something at the end of the day. You know, I've been through so many jobs where, you know, you feel you like, what I got paid today, but I didn't really do anything, right? So at Mammoth, you know, you can point at the end of the month, you can say, I built all these things. Like yeah. I either built this, this small extension or I built this course. 
um, you know, I edited these videos and I can point to it, right? And you can say, you know, it's, this, is, this, this is the thing I've done. It's, it's an output that, that we've, we've done here. So um, not everyone's like that though. Some people need to be, um, you know, more, more of like, um, well, they, they just don't like uh, producing so much. They need to be kind of like, you know, I'll fix this thing or yeah. um, I'll, I'll, I'll make this look a little bit better, but they don't need to be producing things as, as much as they can. So, it, so the people that have left, they don't quite want to do this, that produ production as much. So, so now as CEO and leader of your business, do you do much coding, developing at this stage of your career? I do. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, a lot of people do those Sudoku, uh, like on the, on the train or, or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you can do is if you want to expand your mind is you can just code. Like it doesn't have to be a product or anything. Mm. Um, it just, it happens that if you learn to code, you know, there's a possible job waiting for you in the future. Yeah. But, you know, I've been through this multiple times in my career where, you know, I've got like a really big check and I like took the month off. Right. But at the end of the month, you expect to be happier because you, you know, you, you're, um, you, you took all this time off, but I wasn't. So I'm always, I need to do something. Right. And I always need to produce something. So I do constantly code and, you know, right now, um, Mammoth, uh, is, is consulting, um, as well. So I need to keep up on the technology. So even if I spend an hour or two trying to code through something, I can learn the logistics of it so that I can use it in my consulting. Oh, interesting. So, um, so, so there's no, no aspiration to be purely business. You, you, you want to, so, so, so do you, do you develop your, your courses? Um, do you, do you develop the, the coding within those courses? Obviously the consultancy business is something slightly different because you need to be on top of everything and be able to talk to people about the most up-to-date if it's a technology or if it's a business the new thing that's gonna is gonna gonna hit the market so um do, do you have different hats i suppose that's my question do you do you one day you develop or are you constantly flitting between your consultancy your coding your ceo etc how, how does it work for you so as a small company you generally have to wear different hats right like when you're in corporate like everything is a lot more streamlined um, and, but, but yeah, essentially, so again, I always look to what the trend is and I get a lot of people asking me, um, you know, do I need this for my technical projects? Okay. Yeah. And I say, well, you can hire me as a consultant and I can do that. For, I, I can tell you what you need. Right. So that's like the new thing that I've, that has, has come to me. And this is actually fairly recent, uh, okay. in, in business. But the short answer is, is the way that I do things is I develop something in a system to do a particular task, mm -hmm. and then I make sure I automate it. So the okay. course production, okay. all automated. And it actually took right. me nine months to figure out how to do this. Because it used to be just me. Mm -hmm. um, so it used to be just me, and then I hired a bunch of people. But it took me nine months to figure out how to do that cost-effectively, right? Yeah. I mean, you can do something you know, cost-ineffectively really easily. But to do it cost-effectively is really hard. And so now I'm coding a few things to get that to be completely automated. Right. And you know, there's always something that I need to do. And then so to, to kind of figure out the, the way to do it the most efficient way possible. And then I move it over to be automated. And, and so, so this, this process is an interesting uh, concept about automating because uh, when you're, um, when you're, uh, When you're, you're working through, uh, you, like, for example, I, 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 I've just left my job. I, so I'll talk a little bit about not having very much to do in, in a minute. But when, when you're leaving a job, there's a lot of um, responsibility on me to be able to put down what I do in my day um, down on paper. So people at a later stage, when they need to pick something up, they have the details, they know how it's done and, and the processes. How, how from, a, from your sort of side do, of automation, what's different? How do you do that? Like, do you, do you automate it by somebody else doing it for you? Or are you coding something to 
automate that you click a button and it moves so for example this podcast if if i i could i could automate it by um having a process which i just press a button which then puts it to youtube puts it to my podcast etc 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 what's mm-hmm. what's the sort of um level of or, or in your business do you do you document versus build something that is literally someone else can c- come in and click a button and it does those 10 tasks that you do yeah so that's another big buzzword in technology is is automation but yes. you have to remember that the the idea of just like you know pushing a button and having a computer do everything for you um, you know in some cases it might work but it's still you need some human um, yes. interaction with that so what I mean by automation is that I'm not a part of the process right. meaning that right. you know I can take a four-week vacation and the business is not up in flames like that's what I mean by automate yeah. so and the way that I do it is, um, you know, for me, I always have, like, if you think of a building, you've got a bunch of blocks or a bunch of raw parts that make a building. So I always say, okay, is there a better way that I can do this at one-tenth the cost yeah. um, than, than literally all my other competition? And if I hadn't done that, like, Mammoth would not be around today. So um, by doing that, I always, I not only try to figure out the best way to get a product out there, but to do it in such a way that it is way more cost effective than literally everybody else. That's really interesting. That's really interesting because um, from a, from a very personal point of view here, and it's not all about me, it's about you, but um, the, the podcast stuff that I'm doing now, I, I'm at, at that point of sort of, I would imagine in the next maybe six months, it's going to be a sort of tipping point before uh, I need to get some of the stuff done, maybe automated by a, another person sort of supporting me because at the moment it's all done myself. I, I do everything from the recording to the editing, to the, um, to the po- uh, posting, to the, to the login, to the social media. There's, it's a, the whole creation is, 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 as you said, that bootstrapped is based on, on my, my, and, and, and from a very personal point of view, so, so any sort of tip for sort of, making a process that it's less about me and that anyone could pick up. I, I could employ someone to pick up that that those jobs or those tasks uh, quickly and effectively sure so in so i kind of do do that already with my video editor so as so when i work i i, I picked this up from I worked at Starbucks a long, 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 right. long time ago, right? right? You and didn't put that in your LinkedIn profile. I didn't put it in my LinkedIn, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a random job, right? I actually went there to learn how a billion dollar business works, and right. and the thing about Starbucks that I learned, and this is one thing, it's like even if you're at a job, you could probably learn something new for your mm-hmm. career, but at Starbucks. The, they do something that nobody else does. They, their managers can do every task underneath them. Okay. And then, you know, I was thinking about this, like, can I apply that to my business? And I know how to do everybody else's task. Okay. Right. So if someone says this is going to take 30 hours, I'm like, ah, no, it's not going to take that. Yeah. I can do it in five. So maybe take more than 10, right. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. and, and in the business world, in the technical world, this happens as well. Like Elon Musk, knows everything about his business okay yeah. and that's probably the best example of it and as a ceo if you're going to be your own business you need to know everybody's task to yeah. at least a certain degree right because that way you know how much things cost like yeah. if you need to build this cool widget for your website yeah. and someone says this is going to cost thirty thousand dollars you're going to say ah no that's not, that's not, that's that doesn't cost thirty thousand um you know it, it you'll if you know what things cost and how to do things, you'll be a better CEO. So for you, um, you know, you want to do your video editing and you can say, okay, this is what I want to do. Hmm. And this, and if you spend this amount of time, you should be able to do a better job than me. Now, what's interesting is that when I automate it, I want to make sure the person's doing a better job than I ever could. And all of my employees do that. So they do a better job than I could because they're focusing just on that one task. Yeah. Whereas my day is like, okay, I need to section it off into these different sections. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so interesting. So um, uh, thank you for that little bit of consultancy. <laughs> <laughs> there you um, go. Um, so so you, you were saying that if you took a month off, 
you 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 might be bored because you're not in the the sort of throes of your business i i from a very personal point of view i i've left my current job uh, last friday um and starting my next job in the following monday so i've got basically a week off um i have i basically stacked back a lot of this podcast stuff to the for to this week so we've got an interview here i've got another interview later on in the week i've got other sort of things that are sort of coming up that i've i've produced in this in this week and it's interesting if i if i just stopped doing the podcasting stuff um although my wife would be very, very pleased that all of the jobs around the house would be done, uh, which I am doing as well, uh, please be noted. But I think I would find, so th this is my side hustle, and, and, and I think I would find a sort of a less um, appreciation, not to go too deep, but appreciation of life and, and just sort of your priorities and, and how you do those things. So I do think I 100% I, I agree with the side hustle. I've talked a lot um, on podcasts and, and sort of videos about the 70 20 10 principle and sort of, so you should have your 70%. But for me, it's my career. Uh, the 20% is like the podcast or the YouTube. The 10% is it's a myriad of a lot of other things, which sort of I'm sort of testing to see if there's any traction on that. Um, would would you would you subscribe to the seventy twenty ten or as CEO do you have twenty of those things which you need to keep on top of? Yeah, so um, you know even even myself, you know there I, I read an article about, about you know different side hustles. I'm like you know what that sounds actually kind of fun, <laughs> but to do in your spare time. Um, but you know that for most people having, um, a side hustle or something that you can just point back to and say, I, I did this. Yeah. Um, I find that, you know, over time you, you look back at your life and you say, okay, yeah, yeah, I did that. And, and it, and it does feel, feel really good. Um, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I've, I've ever received is that your future self is always looking back on you. Right. So yeah. you, you want to make your future self proud by doing a good job today. So yeah. You know, I've produced a lot of courses, a lot of games. And, you know, some of those games have done, like, you know, decently well for a day or two in the app store. But, it, you know, I haven't made, like, you know, Angry Birds or anything like that. Yeah. So even if you're not super successful, yeah. you can be proud of yourself yeah. that you got something done. Yeah. And not only from not only is it good from a money point of view, it, it, it's good from a personal health point of view. Yeah. Um, so as we talk about side hustle, so you've, you've got a new course, I think it's called side hustle and entrepreneurial course. Um, tell me about it. Yeah. So this was one of the most requested, um, courses from my user base. And, uh, what I basically did is since I've been an entrepreneur, well, since I was basically in high school, uh, so, uh, I decided to put everything I know into a course and, um, and this, and it's uh, it's a very highly edited video course, okay. and uh, it has everything I know, everything you need to know about setting up a side hustle, um, all the tips and tricks that you need, and plus all the things that I personally failed at, right? <laughs> uh, too. So, and and it's good to talk about that. You know, that's another thing about failures is like if you're just open with it, um, you know, and you just talk to some people, you know, you can say, you know, I made a really bad mistake here. And like, you know what that, ha and someone might say, Hey, that happened to me too. Right. Mm -hmm. But guess how I got over it. And then all of a sudden you've learned something. Right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so this course not only talks about, um, and not only talks about, uh, side hustles, but it has a budgeting section as, as well. Right. You know, over the years I found out that if you are really good at budgeting, um, you will be richer just by just like, you know, taking a, like an F 30 minutes a week to just plug some things into a spreadsheet, yeah. you will be, um, it's about what you save, right? So yeah. um, uh, I put that in the course as well. Awesome. Um, so, so sort of um, on, moving that forward, just about entrepreneurship, what sort of, um, if I say soft skills, what sort of skills outside of coding and so something very technical, what sort of skills would you say are important for an entrepreneur? Okay, so I'm glad you brought up soft skills because as a coder, this is like the number one thing you need to learn, believe it or not, <laughs> outside of the coding. Uh, you know, it's, it's so true. Um, but 
Uh, I actually had, so I'm an introvert, right? Okay. And I just like sitting in my room and building things. And yeah. it was really hard for me to just go out and meet people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just networking um, is a great way um, yeah. to, to, make your, to make your business. But, you know, just like simple soft skills. Um, my favorite uh, tip is to talk more about the other person uh, yes. than, than about yourself. And my favorite hack is to not bring business cards. Okay. You, you only collect business cards and then okay. you email them afterwards because everyone wants to uh, hand out their business cards, right? Yeah. So if you collect them, uh, it's, uh, people want to give you their business cards. So that's my favorite um, kind of hack. So if, if we've got, let's just, let's just explore that a little bit further because I work with, um, work with coders who have no interest in the business side at all. If you give them a task to build an app or build something, they're, they're happy as Larry to work on that for, for two or three months or two or three weeks, whatever it is. Um, but, but from someone who is introverted, um, would you would you say something, because I, I think these sorts of skills are, are, are practice. I think a lot of, if you don't, if you feel uncomfortable networking, then do you know what? Go to a networking event and, and sort of dip in and dip out, to, but keep on going back. So you'd go in and you'd go and speak to someone and you'd have a, whether it's a good conversation or a bad conversation, depending on the other person, it's not always down to you. But if, you, if you're finding yourself a little bit, I say panic, there's probably an extreme version, but it's just like apprehensive, then step out, compose yourself, then go back in. And it's sort of a, uh, it's, 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 I can't remember the psychological uh, description, but it's essentially sort of like immersing yourself into something that you don't feel very comfortable with, but equally giving yourself that, that, that time or space to breathe, calm yourself and then go in again. I mean, is there any, any would, would, would you say that, Immersion techniques are, are powerful for, for someone to, to t be taught those, those, those business skills and those networking skills. Yeah. So, uh, so you just have to understand that it's like a skill like anything else. And, you know, going back 15 years, I was really not good at it, but over the years, you know, reading a few articles here and there and just kind of improving on it, then it eventually, eventually works out. Um, you can always go to a different, city where you know nobody <laughs> yes, and yes, just like yeah. well i always throw myself right off the deep end right, right. And just go into it. so you can just like go somewhere where you don't know anybody yeah and then it might be easier it might be harder and just like you basically you just have to practice yes i 100 percent agree practice is is one of the, the, the critical and trying to work out all the different scenarios before you you're getting ready for it just it's sort of taking a little bit of aside and um so mentors, have you had a mentor and whether it's a, a, something that's paid for, whether it's someone that's experienced that you've known or, or have known in your friends or family, did you, did you explore, did you need a mentor? Did you, how did you develop those or did you develop those skills through using mentors? Um, I haven't done that, but you know what? It's something, it's something that I think everyone needs. You know, even top CEOs have a person to yeah. talk to. Yep. It's kind of like a, a, a business counselor, if you will, right? Yep. <laughs> so uh, it's probably good to have, have uh, someone to do that. I've never done that personally, but, um, you know, I might, I, might look into, um, I might look into that. So, but it's interesting because as um, uh, reading various books and things like uh, Bill Gates' his mentor was Warren Buffett. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg's was Steve Jobs before he passed, and I think a lot of the things that I, I've talked about also is is that mentorship is is very important. Whether it's something that you, um, whether that the person even knows that your mentor, like it's, it's sometimes a little bit cliched now, of 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 having a mentor. So um, it might just be someone that you work with who's more experienced and sort of shares their knowledge with you all the way to the extreme of um actually formally paying for it uh, there's a there's a whole myriad of what a mentor is and who that who that person can be um i found it incredibly important and incredibly helpful in the way that i've conducted my career um and i'm always someone that that whether it's someone that you need you need um you need you, you, you it, it's sometimes helpful just to as you say a career coach someone to just to bring you along and give you a little bit of guidance um 
so I would I would I would definitely be an advocate of that even even as you as a successful businessman I, I think it's important um, and so so just coming back to your career so you've been based in education for a long time now um, what why 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 was education was it something that you sort of fell into um, and and sort of then just found new ways of being able to educate other people um so yeah i did kind of just fall into it um but at the same time you know if you're gonna build something um and want to improve people's lives education is probably one of the best things to do yeah uh one of the best kind of things to do and what's actually interesting is that um in the next decade e-learning is going to be one of the biggest industries out there and so yeah. i know i have quite a bit of experience in that and you know i do consult with some companies um some e-learning companies and some education companies as well about yeah. you know curriculum or um or just kind of basically uh you know logistics and whatever uh but uh but you know it's something that um i do enjoy doing but at the same time, one of, the, one of the things about making courses that no one really talks about is that it's really hard. Like making coding courses is really difficult because yeah. not only do you have to be a good coder, you yeah. have to have a good you know, presentation skills and you have yeah. to make the code easy because if you've ever been a coder, I mean, sometimes the code you look at is incredibly complicated, right? Mm -hmm. But if you make incredibly complicated code for your coding courses, you're gonna get one star reviews, right? So. Yeah. I mean, so it's actually really difficult um, to do that. And as you say, with all this sort of cyclical from the creative to the technical, you've got to be able to explain yourself. You've got to be able to explain your code, why you went in that particular avenue. And I think, I think that's really a, a, a good point. Like you've, you've demonstrated in your, in your career, in your businesses, that to balance that creativity that you need to, um, to run a course or or or, or consult or uh, versus the technical being able to develop and and do the coding, I think it's a, I think it's a it's a really interesting concept, and I would say, um, it's a good balance between getting both out of out of you and getting the business working um, working as best. Um, so so if you were to give one piece of advice about investing in a business or as an entrepreneur or um in even in yourself uh, whether that, that's someone on one of your courses what what sort of um what sort of types would what sort of techniques would you give for uh, investing in yourself so if you're going to invest in yourself you have yeah. to make sure that you are a good investment and um you know one of the things that i learned is you know when i first started Hold up a second. Sorry, can we just pause for a minute? So as I was saying, um, how, what advice would you give for my listeners on how to invest in a business or as an entrepreneur or, or even in themselves on, on online courses? Yeah, so if you're going to invest in yourself um, specifically, you want to make sure that you're a good investment. And one of the things I learned, um, you know, working at one of my odd jobs when I wasn't an entrepreneur, is that I, you know, if I had a week off, I wouldn't spend 40 hours working on my business. I'd spend maybe like 10 or 20, and then the rest of the time I'd be doing something else, right? So, you know, you should really take it upon yourself to work as hard as you work at a job, right? Yeah. Or even hard. In fact, you have to work a little bit harder yeah. than yeah. than you do at a job. So, uh, so you have to, you know. So, if you're going to invest in yourself, you have to make sure that you're working. You're working really hard to do. If, and and some people they're not meant to be entrepreneurs, and I understand that. And and if that's you, that's okay. You yeah. know, it it, it was a, it was a self a realization thing that you did, yeah. right? For me, you know, I, I like working with people, uh, but I've really liked entrepreneurship as well. And I knew, like, once I got my big uh, hit on Udemy, that this was it. And I just put the pedal to the metal. And I would wait. I was, and at the time, I was waiting for a big push. And that yeah. was it. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your time um where can people find you what's the best place to find you either on social media or your website yeah so the best place uh you you can take a look at our website mammothinteractive.com 
Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. It's at Mammoth Company. Uh, that's probably the best way to get our new, uh, news as quickly as possible. Uh, you can follow me personally. It's at John Burra. And um, if you want to go to Udemy, uh, you can type in Mammoth Interactive and you can see all of our courses there. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of my listeners will get a lot of inspiration from your story. So, so thank you very much. Um, right, to wrap up uh, for me, I just want to just uh, let everyone know that uh, the podcast will be out on Sunday nights um, in the UK, that is. Um, please check it out on the usual uh, places iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, etc. Um, there also is, um, you can find me on Twitter, on Instagram as well, um, at Mark, Hay Mark J. Hayward. Um, and um, check me out on, on YouTube. Also, I've just opened a Patreon account. So if anyone wants to check in there, there's some benefits on there as well. So it'd be most welcome for you guys to join me on Patreon. And you kind of get a behind the scenes look as well. So I'm trying to just test that out and explore that as, as a different kind of medium. So um, thank you, John. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, you'll speak to me soon. Thanks a lot.